Okay. Hello, Steve. Hi. Hey. Good to meet you. I'd like to uh, begin by sort of, you know, letting us introduce ourselves to each other. And uh, I'm a lifelong political activist, you know, from my mother, you know, who was a refugee survivor who escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto, as you might know. And uh, so I'm very uh, enchanted to be able to meet with you, who's also a, a struggler in the uh, American scene against Americanism. <laughs> so. Yes, yes, Americanism. I think we both started uh, uh, in high school uh, as uh, political organizers as well, I believe. Yes, um, I essentially was an activist in high school, just a high school student, and um, became familiar with certain political newspapers, organizations, and thought that they spoke to the reality of life uh, that I saw in the United States. I think that's where I began my anti-imperialism, and to this day, I still have that perspective. Yeah, yeah. I've developed uh, more so in that direction, uh, under the influence of uh, Jason Inru, to uh, conceive of, you know, third worldism, you know, as a, str as a political uh, strategy, you know, which I hadn't really thought of, you know, in its uh, full uh, in entirety, you know, be before, you know, like I... I knew that the uh, national revolutionary struggle for independence in the third world would uh, only be fulfilled, you know, by socialist revolution to be, you know, completed as a national revolution and not as, you know, a game played by the national bourgeoisie. But I didn't realize, you know, that it's key to the whole world struggle. You know, that the thir first world, you know, cannot lead the world into the future. It's really the third world that's going to be the leaders. And China is an example of that. Yeah, I, um, I have to agree with that. Um, I do think there will be, there will, there are going to be important struggles by uh, oppressed peoples and occasionally workers in the first world, but I do agree that internationally, if we take a view that the first world is going to lead the revolution around the world and people in the third world have to wait for the first world, <laughs> I think they, they have been waiting for a long time. Um, yeah, I, I do think that China is a good example um, of what well, I would say where where the action is around the world. It's not in the United States as far as the, the, the struggles for um, national liberation, for socialism, um, that kind of thing. I do think that um, we see a lot of fights in the U.S. go around cop terror. Police, ter I do think police terror um, is something that high that is a highlight or um, I, I want to say a real Achilles tendon within the United States, uh, and you do see fightbacks around that quite often. But, but that doesn't mean it doesn't occur in, in, in the third world. We we, I, we just don't hear about it except in cases like. Um, uh, Nigeria a few years ago, there was a stroke against a, a police unit, a police terror unit, thing, or, you know, we, or, 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 or in South Africa, where, you might, where we're starting to see more um, struggles against the army coming in uh, to quell re rebellions. So I do think there's some things that are going to occur in the, in the U.S. that are very important. Um, but to, min to, to, min to maximize the U.S. or France or Great Britain, or Italy or Germany over the rest of the world and as far as our analysis I think it's it's a mistake also much of the production production is capacity has moved outside at least outside the United States is moved to the third world so as far as working class if you want to take working class analysis a pure working class analysis you'd have to say well the working class is you know international so you would have to look around the world to see what the what, what the working class and the poor are doing in the sense of fighting back and attempting to to like, organize. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a recent sort of kind of a talk, political talk that uh, I saw coming, you know, mostly from the United States, you know, political culture, when they were talking about uh, you know critical race theory or intersectionality. 
and all of that sort of, you know, talk, you know, that was generated initially by the second wave or third wave of feminism. But I find it sort of, you know, like, surprising in a way, you know, like, because for me it's like natural. You know, like I was raised that way, you know, in the Jewish Bund, you know, that my mother was from, you know, the Jewish Socialist Movement in, in Warsaw, you know, and she was in the working class, the whole family was in the working class. And, and everybody, you know, like was supporting the Jewish Bund at the time, you know, like the Zionists were like 8%, you know, popular vote, <laughs> 8%, you know, for the Zionists, you know, 10% for the Orthodox and like, uh, you know, 75%, you know, for the Jewish Bund, you know, because, you know, the Jewish working class was a socialist. And, you know, they called for, you know, survival, you know, and they couldn't survive, you know, because they were boycotted or excluded, you know, like an apartheid kind of a system, you know, in the Christian nation state, in which, you know, Jewish people weren't, you know, permitted to work, you know, in the big industry, you know, they were always pushed into the marginal sectors, you know, the lower working class, the lump in, you know, small shop owners and all that sort of stuff. So they said, you know, like, you know, if the state could exist to protect, you know, the Christian nation state, who's going to protect us? So, you know, we need national cultural autonomy. And so they argued for that, you know, that was the program. And uh, on that, you know, they won the election, you know, in Jewish, Jewish municipal elections. Jewish national autonomy means, you know, security, you know, having own security, having your own uh, uh, self-sustaining, you know, uh, e economy, and, and, uh, and, and that means, you know, like uh, protection, you know, from uh, the majority population. So now I see, you know, you know, the same thing is happening, you know, in terms of other social formations, like, first of all, you know, the women, you know, which is not just a minority, you know, like it's a majority of the population, 51% actually. So then that kicked off, you know, okay, now the black nation existed, you know, conceptually in political theory, you know, before, you know, in the 30s especially, and it's coming back, and it has its identity, and it's calling, you know, for uh, self-defense, and to me, you know, that's the same as national cultural autonomy. And if we're talking about a social revolution, we're going to have to talk about, you know, giving place to national cultural autonomy for each of the oppressed national minorities, in particular, you know, the First Nations. The Native uh, Nations, you know, will have to have their uh, independence, national cultural autonomy, and not only that, but also territorial autonomy as well. So we need a whole new constitution, constitutional assembly, you know, to do this sort of thing, where the majority of the delegates are from the working class. So... Yep. Yeah, we and and that's gonna be you know what if you think about that, uh, uh, Dr. Whitefield, the entire formate the entire framework of what you would call social analysis or political discourse in the U.S. doesn't even address this. Yeah, it doesn't even talk about this. It's all about something else. So that's the importance of um, us having our conversation and trying to explore some some ways this can occur because you're right um right now it's really focused on the first world the first world view and the the uh analysis which puts the first nation the black nation um this the, the colonies the u.s colonies have never talked about anything about it. hawaii mm -hmm. alaska guam micronesia i mean the official colonies puerto rico mm -hmm. there's always like some side issue when those are like the key issue because all that all those people are denied self-determination they, they're denied uh socialist development mm -hmm. because of the capitalist framework in the, in the u.s so i think it's very important that we talk about this I, yes. I, I i really i really um commend you for bringing that up because it's not talked about at all mm -hmm. that's a you know very logical you know like a deduction there you know because uh you know, you can talk about the United States, you know, the old colonies as well, like New Mexico, Texas, California, you know, like it's very profound, you know, it goes, you know, includes all of history. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. But, sure. uh, you know, the United States is still pretty strong, you know, like it's not sort of imminent. Oh, oh, very strong, very, but I think very strong. The, yeah, it's, but uh, the third world revolution will un undermine, you know, the, the, uh, the clay feet of the U.S. empire eventually. And uh, that shattered pretty quickly in uh, Af Afghanistan recently. Boy, that was quite oh, a something. Yeah. yeah, the Afghans, the struggle, um, well, first of all, I think 
activists in the U.S. did a, you know, it was a piss poor job of showing solidarity with Afghanistan, but that's, yeah. we do a very poor job of that any. Yeah. Uh, we're so focused on our noses and not the world, so, I mean, we, we, we have a lot of self-criticism within the U.S., but you're right. The Afghan situation fell apart very quickly. It just crumbled. It's like, like a house of cards. And, um, uh, it does, but, but one thing I can say though, post Afghan crumbling, the U.S. had to pull out. The Afghans still don't have the money that, that like the U.S. stole. Uh, yeah. The U.S. still freezing their own assets. They still freeze their assets. So I think one of the, one of the programs I do think we have to talk about is sanctions and stopping the U.S. and the third, first world from grabbing the third world's money, which is kept in U.S. banks. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been sanctioned by a bank, but I have. And let me tell you something. Yeah. It's a bad feeling. All of a sudden, I mean, your money's gone. Well, we got some order from somebody to take your <laughs> money. Well, yeah. and, and you have no right. It's just like, well, they said, you know, so it's the same thing. Well, you know, we're, we're going to take Iran's money and hold it for 10 years. Well, I always want to, you know. <laughs> we're, the, we're the big, we got some law. Yeah. And we're just going to take your money until we decide to get back to you. If the first world could do anything, it's like that. Because that would require us to put the, first, the third world first. Uh -huh. And that's one of the, the real weaknesses I find in the current paradigm of thinking. Mm -hmm. Is not opposing sanctions of the U.S. and the West against third world countries. Uh -huh. It's just amazing. It goes on. Yeah. But like nothing is being said. Afghan, Afghans still didn't have their money. Yeah. yeah. Let's just take it and seize their money. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's something that, you know, I think, you know, yeah. we didn't talk about. We talk about for third world and those in, in the big in the West countries have to fight and raise kindness about this this sanctions nonsense. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just putting it out there because right after it fell like a house of cards, boom. Yeah. But it just crumbled. Yeah. And that shows how empires the empire's reach can be can be destroyed. Re re Long term, and all of a sudden, boom, gone. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now the assets of a of a Libya are still being held in the banks in, in New yeah, York. Yeah. I'm talking about right there. You know, 15, yeah. uh, 15 billion in, in New York. Uh, Twenty. How is, how is that possible? <laughs> they just take their freaking money. Yeah. Uh, you know, they even. Right, they, so that's. Yeah. That's the rule. That's the rule. The imperialists right there over over. Oh, 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 the third world. That's the rule of over oh, the third world. Okay, yeah. I'm just seizing their assets. Well, we're going to keep it. Well, we want to. You know, we got yeah. a rule. We got a law. We got to take your stuff. Yeah. yeah. What can't... is the rule? I mean, I'm not saying I'm for the United Nations, but what WTF? What their role in all is? Obviously, they, no. they must support it. They, no. they do nothing to stop it. Yeah, no. It's the world financial I'm, system. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, yeah. you know, it's just, for me, that's. That's a critical for first world issue. Yeah. Opposing sanctions. If you're for third world so you, if, if, if you're for the international proletariat, you have to oppose sanctions, right? And make it an issue that doesn't go away. Yeah. Yeah. At least within consciousness. And yeah. you know what I'm saying? It, it nothing will change unless you push on this. Yeah. It, I did not even know that they had Libyan money still. I don't know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, I worked with Libya, you know, like uh, you know, uh, when Gaddafi was uh, was uh, at his best, uh, and since a long time, you know, and uh, Libya had uh, 15 billion in assets uh, frozen in New York, 20 billion in assets frozen in Canada, and another 15 billion in assets frozen in Switzerland, and you know the same thing is you know r you know happens to Iran. Iran has its assets frozen as well. They still haven't gotten back. So Iran is you know like raise that matter in the current negotiations when the United States wanted to add the question of missiles into the agreement, Iran said, well, what about, you know, like our assets that are still frozen, you know, like why don't we add that in as well, you know, and the U.S. refuses, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a good, a good deal. Let's, let's add that too. Let's put that first on the list. <laughs> yeah. That's first, first on the list, because, you know, I mean, I, I, I can say, if, if, if you have to work in, work, work in person, the first thing they want to talk to the boss is what? Pay, pay and benefits. That's my pay, so I, I yeah. can't. Yeah, agree. Yeah, agree. Right, right. Um, there is. Uh, um, so you know, in the third world, you know, like uh, 
Well, the Third World Revolution, national liberation struggles have been active, you know, since the end of the Second World War. You know, the United Nations started with, like, what, 41 nation states? And then boomed into now, you know, 143 from 41. And the 143rd is Palestine. They're not, they don't have a vote, they just have, you know, a seat. Non-voting, recognized state. Right. So, <laughs> so, which what means nothing, mean? you know, like, you know, it's like... It means colony. Yeah. So... I mean, somebody is, yeah, is somebody, I mean, somebody is, that's, that's not right. Yeah. That's what it means. Well, you know, this is the, November 29th is the uh, anniversary of the 1947 partition resolution, which gave, you know, a, a big chunk of Palestine to the Zionist nation state. And then they totally ignored the frontiers and, you know, rode right over them, you know, to take over, you know, another third of Palestine. And, uh, and nothing was said. Nothing was said by the United Nations thereafter. You know, and everybody thinks that it's illegal. Incredible, you know. The Green Line what, is not even a frontier. It's called an armistice line, you know, that was signed between Israel and Jordan. And still, you know, <laughs> treated as the official boundary of Israel by the United Nations. It's pathetic. But the third world, you know, is taking over the United Nations in terms of the General Assembly. But now the Security Council has, has sort of, you know, thrown the General Assembly, you know, to the wind in saying that their resolutions are not legal anymore. Only the Security Council resolutions are legal or bind, That's binding. That's interesting. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. So they made one concession to the third world. They allowed China to come into the Security Council. That's it. That's all. Yeah. But economically, that's, you know. That's, yeah, it's pathetic. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, but that, that the, I did not know that. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if, you know, the international law was applied, you know, Israel would have to go back to, you know, Route 186, it's called, in Israel which is, you know, half of 1948 Israel, <laughs> you know, if international law was actually applied. You know, the UN could send in peacekeeping troops and just push them back. But at least they should do so for the West Bank to protect it, you know, the, the Palestinians there from the fascist settlers. We've been asking, you know, for uh, international peacekeeping troops to come in there to protect the Palestinians. That's one of the demands that we formulated. Well, you know, um, let me ask you this. Considering UN peacekeeping troops, we've seen their actions in uh, Haiti, we've seen them in Congo, we've seen their actions around the world. Why? I'm just asking as, as, as a question. Hmm. Why can we, why should we have any faith that they can be effective? Or is that simply a political, a political um, demand that we're making? Because those troops seem to be, I mean, they came to, came to Haiti and Oh, yeah. uh, uh, spray cholera or raping the women, you know, just, yeah. you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It all depends. Is it more of a political demand? I'm, I'm curious. It all depends upon who controls, you know, the selection of the peacekeeping troops, whether it's a security council or, or if it's a general assembly. If it's a general assembly, you know, they'll choose, you know, troops, you know, from favorable countries, you know, to protect the Palestinians for, for real. If not, you know, then they can end up sending in Saudi Arabian troops, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, we've seen Saudi Arabia's actions in Yemen. I think we had with yeah. uh, with a good friend, uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, we we kind of see what Saudi Arabia is about. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that's one thing we've seen, but just within the last few years. Yeah. yeah. Hey, do you remember back when we spoke? You know, uh, when the beginning of the. Uh, Black Lives Matter revolt was taking place mm -hmm. right at the very beginning, you know, and, and we were just, you know, thinking and, and feeling, you know, I think rather sad, you know, about uh, the most recent murder. Right. And, uh, and yet, you know, I felt that there was, you know, like, uh, I had a sense that, you know, everybody would be feeling, you know, this way and that there would be, you know, a motivation, you know, to sort of break out of the uh, impasse that the police were imposing upon people's liberties. And I, I felt like it was going to be a historic moment. Remember that? And, and it turned into, you know, a generalized revolt, you know, of 28 million people, the biggest revolt, you know, in mass mobilization of people in American history. Right, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, I, I, 
think that um, I think that the black that that, pro, that protest movement uh, that a lot of a year or so ago. I do think that. Okay, here's what I think happened. It's my view. I think that uh, millions of people uh, stood up against the cop murder of George Floyd. I think it shook the imperialists to the to, to the core in the United States. They didn't know what to do. Uh, the demands about um, defund the police really went nowhere. That was killed. It says that I mean, no, nowhere did that happen. Uh, but many activists joined groups like Democratic Social of America or other you know activist groups. Um, I do think that what it what encouraged me to be very to be very candid was all the white people I saw in the streets. I was very impressed with them. Yeah. The most people I saw in the streets where I went were white. Yeah. They were opposing the murder of a black man by a white racist police officer. Yeah. So I think that the consciousness didn't go anywhere. But what, what, what we saw was black faces on advertisement. You see what, you, what we see now, we see that. Yeah. We've seen the squad come in and try to, you know, provide some left cover for their Democratic Party um, uh, action, pro-Democratic Party actions. We haven't really, we really didn't see um, a organizational capacity and movement um, that continued in that format because these, 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 these were mass spontaneous protests. So when that ends, those who, are, those who got organized during this protest, we're going to continue to do something. Hmm. Um, I, I think DSA as a group got a lot of members, got a lot of class. I think college campuses in general, in general, are more progressive. At least the activism on college campuses maybe went to um, the uh, environmental movement, groups like um, uh, Extinction ex, uh, Extraction, I think ex, Extraction Extinction, so, some of these groups around ex, um, environmentalism get, got, have gained members. Um, I think among, among the black masses, unfortunately, the black politicians step up and try to gain the momentum for, well, we have to do this and vote, vote for more black elected officials and blah, 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 which hasn't changed anything as far as the power dynamic. Um, but we had the, and, but, but at the same time, when these, when you have these cop terror trials that happen in, well, not the cop terror trial, but trials of, of Kyle Rittenhouse or the three people who murdered the black man in Georgia, it still gets attention because of the movement last year or the last a few summers ago around Black Lives Matter. So I do think that movement had an impact on social consciousness. Um, what it hasn't had, in my view, is an organizational uh, component. Like, what group or groups have been able to galvanize that support and push it in a certain direction. I think that still, that still need, needs to happen. Um, but the attention to Kyle Rittenhouse, irrespective of, of, of the jury, the attention to what happened in Georgia, irrespective of the jury outcome, I think evolved and developed from that Black Lives Matter protest a couple of years ago. So, you know, I, I think that among, I, I do think among, I want to say um, 20, 20 something, 30 something, even 40 something white people, I sense more recognition of racism in, in the society. I did. Because where I work, if, you know, you still see Black Lives Matter posters in windows of, or offices, and these are from white workers and white, white, um, uh, M, employees. You didn't see that before the George Floyd protest. No, mm -hmm. no, you didn't. Mm -hmm. So you do see some, you know, I think at least conscious, consciousness raising among that population, which I think is good. I think it's positive. It's not anti-imperialist, but it is anti-racist, which mm -hmm. is, I think, positive. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I came across some of my writings on China before, and I realized that the uh, that the critique that I was making of the uh, Popular Front as opposed to a United Front 
was something that could be applied to the United States because, you know, like in the United States, you know, you have the social democratic formation, the Democratic Socialists of America. Okay, so, and there, you know, playing this popular front game in which they're united with the so-called progressive national bourgeoisie in the Democratic Party to install, you know, uh, reforms, uh, uh, a, a reformist, you know, path to socialism, supposedly. And yet it doesn't work. It hasn't worked. In China, it didn't work. It just resulted in the massacre of 1937-1938. And Mao had to come out of that with a different strategy. And he did. And he was successful in doing so because it wasn't, you know, a bourgeois revolution that they were making. In effect, it was a socialist revolution, for real. And uh, they learned that. And so the Popular Front, I think, is discredited, you know, and it's discredited by the Democratic Socialists of America as well. And furthermore, I would add, it's discredited by the popular front that the Zionists had set up in the 30s. And you know who got sucked into that? Chomsky was into that. Einstein was into that. The big theorist Hans Kohn, you know, all these cultural Zionists, you know, who were for bicultural confederation under Zionist leadership. Well, it didn't happen, you know, because the national bourgeoisie controlled the whole affair. It was, for, you know, the project to set up a nation state for the national bourgeoisie so that they could have security not the Jewish working class. So, the Popular Front is credited there as well. But in the United States, how to get out of that trap of the Popular Front strategy of Democratic Socialists of America? When is the Democratic Party gonna split off, you know, its left wing? Aren't they gonna learn, you know, at one point that they're always going to be marginalized, you know, like Bernie Sanders was, and that their only hope for actually achieving anything in their lifetimes is to actually break off and start the new society by starting a new political form, formation, united front of all, you know, the all the uh, movements and all the uh, political formations that are called third-party formations, except for the fascists. But uh, when when could this possibly happen? You know, I know the United States, you know, like is slow, and it's a third-world country. It doesn't have much of a revolutionary potential. But is this at least, you know, like possible? to overcome the impasse presented by the Democratic Party? I think it's possible. Um, you, there, there, I think I mentioned to you maybe in, a, in another conversation that we weren't recording that there are people in the U.S. that I know of right now that are organizing um, committees to form what they call a labor party. And there are people from the left and they are f focusing on this kind of, uh, this kind of idea that the DSA approach, the DSA movement, is really about bringing people into the Democratic Party, albeit from a quote left or left of center perspective. And, and the attempt is to make it more. This this movement I'm talking about is uh, an attempt to make to develop a more labor-centered, activist-centered um, yeah. movement. I I don't know. I, I I do see what you're saying as far as um, the conflict that inevitably is going to happen within this uh, DSA